thank you, Matt. Um, it's great to be back. So I was here um, presenting actually China's Bill and Road Initiative two years ago, um, and I really enjoyed the conversation with the audience. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'm very excited to be back. And hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Kathy Wu. I am um, assistant professor at ODU, and this is my third year. Um, yes. So today um, I'm going to talk about China's road into Latin America. And I really need to admit to the audience first that this area, Latin America, is one of the areas that I haven't explored academically and personally. Like, I really wanted to travel there. I haven't been able to do that because of the grad school, work, everything. Um, and when I'm teaching politics and international relations in East Asia, I always tell my students that um, like Asia is a such big area, China is so much different from Japan, from Singapore, and now I kind of have to do the same thing that I discourage my students from doing, that really group Latin America into a big area with so much variation. Um, so my solution to that is trying to give you some, um, within 40 minutes-ish, to give you a brief overview about China's relationship with Latin America and Caribbean countries um, kind of give you some historical background and also a little bit overview about what the current stage looks like, some economic um, relations and some of the political considerations um, behind China's foreign relations in Latin America and where Latin America fit in to China's big foreign policy agenda. Mm -hmm. And also towards the end, um, share some of my views about what that implies to Latin America and to the United States a little bit. And so it's going to be a very um, general overview then for the break, and I really enjoyed the Q&A session. That's the, my most exciting part. Okay, so, right, so um, give you some ideas about historical overview, current economic relations, political considerations, and we'll wrap up with some implications and impacts. So, China and Latin America relationship um, was not developed very much historically, um, mostly because of the geographical distance, right? So it's very far away. And largely, the bilateral relationship was not very significant, at least in the first half of the Cold War, while China was busy with Korean War and its competition against the United States, etc., etc. Right? So the focus was more on East Asia and also with Soviet Union. Not much about um, Latin America until um, the bilateral relationship between China and the United States was improving in the early 1970s when Nixon and Kissinger visited China and both sides were kind of like really normalizing the bilateral relationship. And so after that, um, Chairman Mao Zedong initiated this kind of like three worlds theory, right? So that sounds a little bit like a third world theory, but it's slightly different. Um, so he initiated this kind of three world theory in 1974, like after the normalization or um, the improvement of US China relationship. And so this is what he said. Basically, um, Mao did not divide the world into this capitalist camp and the communist camp. Um, that's not what this three world theory was about. Right? So he really kind of like divided the world based on economic status and um, the, the division between developed countries and developing countries. Right? So US and Soviet Union belong to the third world and we and all the developing countries in East um, in Asia, Africa, Latin America belong to the third world. And everything in between, like Japan, Western European countries belong to the second world in the middle. Right? So that's how he see the world after um, 1970s. And even though the th three worlds theory um, it's not mentioned very much in the official rhetoric nowadays in Chinese official um, statements. But this kind of thinking about developing worlds and China's position in the developing world um, still have lots of impacts 
at least until Xi Jinping came to power like several years ago. And so uh, Mao's idea was iterated by Deng Xiaoping um, in the UN General Assembly, right? So, and again, that also impacted some of the following leaders. And so kind of give you some ideas about what all these leaders we're talking about, right? So this is a GDP rate, um, GDP level of China, right? So since 1978, um, China's GDP grows super fast, and the first important leader was Deng Xiaoping, right? So he was really kind of um, the pioneer of China's economic reform and opening up. And internationally, he kind of stuck to this um, non-alignment policy, right? So really <coughs> try to be independent and neutral in foreign policy, and really try to keep low profile, and focus on um, economic development for China. And after Deng Xiaoping, um, President Jiang Zemin, so one of his biggest tasks was try to recover China's international image after Tiananmen incident. Right, so he really focused on this kind of strategic partnership. You, know, you will hear this um, very often after he came to power and really try to develop some very important bilateral relationship with great powers, such as United States, Western European powers. Um, those bilateral relationships were kind of um, damaged after the Tiananmen incident. So his job was really trying to continue opening up and recovering China's bilateral relationship with those great powers and to deal with this initial discussion, um, the initial um, perception about China's threat. Right? So now we hear China threat very often, um, but it was first discussed um, widely in the early 1990s. And after Jiang Zemin, um, so he stayed in power, Jiang stayed in power for about 10 years, and after that, um, Mr. Hu Jintao became the president and the party general secretary. And he also stayed in power for 10 years, right? So during these um, two, Presidents, right? So CCP, Chinese Communist Party, was beginning to institutionalize um, its leadership turnover, right? So all the leaders, kind of like top leaders, stay in power for about 10 years, two terms, and there are lots of discussions about whether Xi Jinping would stay in power for, for more than 10 years, right? So we will see um, what happened after 2022. And so when Hu Jintao came to power, he kind of continue um, what Deng and Jiang um, initiated in foreign policy and also in domestic policy, right? So initially, he kind of like um, raised the slogan about peaceful rise and really trying to uh, assure the rest of the world that if, even if China is rising, it's going to be peaceful. And, and even this peaceful rise slogan became a little bit um, concern in the world, and so he actually switched the slogan to peaceful development um, later. And on the other hand, you started to see the international um, community, especially United States, advocate China being a responsible stakeholder, right? So really try to encourage China to take more responsibility. And towards the end of Hu Jintao's term, we started to see um, the term as BRICS, right? So really that's kind of like the first time um, we started to see more substantial improvement or substantial relationship between China and Latin America. Um, but again, as I mentioned, so all these leaders really um, continue Deng Xiaoping's legacy that really um, in terms of keeping low profile, right? So China was, um, <coughs> They not wanted to take too much international responsibility. All I wanted to do is to maintain peaceful environment um, in East Asia and focus on domestic economic um, development. And this approach changed a little bit, well actually some would say quite significantly, when Mr. Xi Jinping came to power in 2012. But so after he came to power, we started to see a more assertive um, image of China in the international society. Right? So China started to building military sites in South China Sea and in some 
disputed territory um, areas. And transposition in South China Sea was actually quite different when Hu Jintao was in power, right? So Hu Jintao's position in the South China Sea disputes was basically trying to settle down all the disputes that's set aside, don't worry too much about it, that's focused on mutual development with Southeast Asian countries, right? So that was changing um, when Xi Jinping came to power. And so he also emphasized this big power diplomacy and really trying to emphasize China as a great power. And if you are interested in this kind of evolution of China's international position and domestic um, economic development, there was a very new documentary called China Complex um, by Al Jazeera. We, you can Google it online, and that was public. That was available last December. It was very new, um, and I think it was a very comprehensive documentary about. China's current position and kind of like really dated back to how some ancient history or some ancient um, culture of China impacted um, the current thinking behind the leadership. So highly recommended. So where does Latin America fit in into this picture? <coughs> so the leaders started to pay more attention to Latin America since Jiang Zemin came to power. Um, and so one of the indicators was always kind of looking at the high level state visits of Chinese leaders. So when Jiang Zemin was in power, um, he paid two visits to Latin America. Right? So one in 2001, the other in 2002. And Hu Jintao um, went to Latin America, like different countries, three times during his term. And when Xi Jinping came to power, only during his first term, right, so from 2012 to 2017, he already visited Latin America three times already. And he also visited some of the Caribbean um, countries which were not very um, received lots of attention by Chinese leaders previously. Right? So that's another indicator that China, the Chinese government is really paying attention to this area um, recently. And another um, official <coughs> statement or official position from China um, was this policy paper on Latin America and the Caribbean, which was published in 2008. Right? So that was kind of the first and only formal policy paper from the Chinese government regarding this area. And I think some of the principles were iterated by Xi Jinping um, as well. So there were kind of like some principles that China think about its bilateral relationship with the region. Right, so politically, the government really emphasized the idea of mutual respect, southern um, cooperation, south-south solidarity, and also the importance of national sovereignty. Right? So this is something that China, the Chinese government has been emphasizing for decades. And China is also contributing um, financially to some of the new regional institutions in, the, um, in Latin America, such as let's see, the Union of South American Nations um, and a couple of other new, uh, more recent regional institutions. But the Chinese government is also balancing between the more recent regional institutions and the existing more kind of US-led international organizations such as um, OAS, right? So Organization of American States. China is a permanent observer of OAS. Um, and China also contributing huge amount of money, like two billion US dollars to um, Inter-American Development Bank. Right, so China is really contributing, um, not just in bilateral relationships in the region, but also in the regional institutions in this area. And another um, key feature of Chinese investment or Chinese economic relationship, and this is not new in the area, and this is also the same in, for example, China-Africa economic relationship, is that the Chinese government really emphasizes this kind of win-win approach and no strings attached, right? So that's something unique of Chinese investment and some governments like it and it also received lots of criticism by the United States, we will talk about that later. But what that really means is that um, 
Previously, if you want to borrow money from IMF, from World Bank, from um, some kind of like Western donors, uh, usually there are some conditions, political conditions, that you need to make some reforms in political institutions, um, for example, liberalize your government, um, reform, um, initiated some like democratic governance reforms, right? So, it, and also adopt some neoliberal economic policies, right? So there's always some kind of political conditions that come with all these foreign aid money. But China is removing all of that, right? So I just give you money, um, and the condition is much less about political situation or political reforms or economic reform. It was more about maybe investing in infrastructure projects or maybe using Chinese companies, right? So just some people will say it's no strings attached, but some people will say it's a kind of a different set of conditions, but, right? So it's very different from um, the approach of Western donors or the approach of some existing um, global institutions like IMF or World Bank. And another idea about like why China needs Latin America or like how China fit into or how Latin America fit into China's um, foreign policy is that I wanted to think about lots of Chinese economic policies and foreign policies as a solu international solutions to Chinese domestic problems. Right? So if you look at the GDP rate in the previous slides, right? so China is rising all the way up things look very good, but if you look at this GDP growth rate, um, it's a little bit different, right? So even though China's econo economy is growing in the past 40 years, but things are going up and down um, over time. And whenever um, China's economy is slowing down, the government or the party, right, so these two are interchangeable, um, the party needs to deal with some domestic um, problems because maintaining economic performances is one of the most important legitimacy that a party has to the people. And so whenever there's economic kind of slowdown, um, there's some domestic unrest or like potential threat of domestic unrest. Um, or the government may tolerate nationalistic sentiment to kind of like let the people express this um, dissatisfaction. But eventually, the government has to come up with some strategies to deal with these economic problems, domestically and internationally. Right? So some international strategies are related to improving China's image, right? so holding Olympics or Bell and Road Initiative, but um, some international strategies are all more related to economic areas. And Latin America really fit into China's going out strategy, right? So going out strategy basically um, is a new strategy initiated in late 1990s to try to increase Chinese um, investment overseas. Um, and the more recent economic solution is this Bell and Road Initiative. Right? So I talked about this two years ago and now I think um, people are getting more familiar with this idea, um, which is also ongoing. Um, I think Latin America also is playing, or is going to play a very important part in this Bell and Road Initiative. But um, what I want to emphasize here is that all these economic strategies that China initiated, to me it was more about solving domestic economic problems and sustaining Chinese economic growth. It's less about China's pursuing superpower status. That may come as a byproduct if China can sustain its economic growth. Uh, but to me, I think the more fundamental problem for the government, for the party, is to sustain economic um, growth and hopefully also improving China's international image, both of which are very important to um, Chinese people in general. Um, so now a little bit about the over, overview of the bilateral relationship between China and Latin America. Um, basically the bilateral trade 
has been improving a lot since the past two decades. Right? So in 2018, um, based on Latin America, exported nearly 160 billion products to China, and also import 150 billion products from China. Right? And the trade deficit of um, Latin America actually reached the year low, um, low, lowest level since 2009. Right? So that was very impressive. And the trade deficit um, was, the lowest trade deficit was mainly driven by the increase of commodity price, which is the major source of Chinese imports from Latin America. And also, um, China-US trade war has some short-term impact um, to this lowest trade deficit as well. But generally, the bilateral trade is looking very good and very promising. And I think this trend will continue, even though there's kind of a short-term um, fluctuation. But overall, I think the bilateral trade is going to rise um, in the future as well. And what China imported most from Latin America is extra, um, extra extraction products and also agriculture. And this is somewhat different from the overall import pattern of China. If you look at, um, I will show next slides, like what, what China's imports look like from um, the, um, the other, the rest of the world. But just in Latin America, most products China imported from Latin America are in the extraction area and also in the agriculture area. So 20%, 20, um, 26% extraction and also 16% agriculture. Right, so mostly commodity products. Very few when it comes to manufacturing products. And this is somewhat unusual if you look at um, all Latin America exports to the world and also if you look at all China imports from the world, right? So this is a very different picture. The bilateral trade between China and Latin America, right, so 50% is about extraction. But if you look at the overall pattern of Chinese imports, <coughs> The amount of extraction is only 19%, um, relatively low. Right? So the majority of Chinese imports are actually manufacturing products. But in Latin America, that's a different picture. Right? So China imports mostly extraction products from Latin America. And agricultural products as well. Right? So the pattern of Chinese imports from Latin America is very different from the overall Chinese imports pattern. Um, the four commodities that received most imports um, or Latin America countries export, exports most to China is soybeans, crude oil, iron, and copper. Right, so agricultural products and um, and minor products. And this has somewhat related to China's big demand for soybean products, as well as China's um, current economic model, which emphasizes a lot on infrastructure. Right, so China has been building railway, airports, um, all kinds of transportation networks, infra infrastructure networks, since the financial global financial crisis in, in 2008. Right, so this has been um, a decade, and because of that, China has a huge demand for um, all these mineral products, and that's why um, extraction products accounted for a huge amount of um, Chinese imports from Latin America. And some short-term effects from U.S.-China trade war which increase China's imports of soybean products from Brazil. Right, so this is the picture about, so previously China imported lots of soybean products from the United States, but after um, 
trade war, the trade, um, the tariff proposed, was proposed and took effect in July 2018. Um, so we started to see that China, as a retaliation, China stopped buying soybeans products from the United States and instead um, China is looking for some alternative sources and most of which come from Brazil. Um, and whether that was a stand is, is uncertain, right? So currently China and United States have this like first phase of agreement and China is China promised to buy more US agricultural products. So this pattern may change. Right, so if China imports more soybean products from the United States again, um, it will definitely reduce relatively the imports from Brazil. But that was the pattern um, when China and United States was fighting a trade war. And even though both countries achieved this first phase of agreement, um, there's lots of uncertainty um, whether both countries will go back to trade war again. And if that's the case, then we can probably see this same pattern appear again. So, relatively speaking, um, the U.S.-China trade war may have some positive impacts to the bilateral trade relationship between China and Latin America. But of course, the downside would be a huge amount of uncertainty, right? So, when trade war occurs, largely speaking, it's, not, it's negative to the entire world because of huge amount of uncertainty and also because of the huge economic size of both countries. And Investment relationship, so China has been increasing investment in Latin America in the past few years, right? So this is about mergers and acquisition. Um, China, achieved, China investment achieved the highest amount in 2017, but failed in 2018, and I think it's continuing to fail um, last year. And this is not just about Chinese investment <coughs> in Latin America. If you look at Chinese investment in the United States, um, the pattern is more or less the same. It reached the highest level in 2017, but it kind of started to slow down um, since 2018. And partially it's because of the Chinese, um, the Chinese government is tightening control of capital flow. Right? So because most of these, um, some are investment from state-owned enterprises, some are actually investment from private enterprises, and in the past few years, there was some tendency about um, moving lots of Chinese capital from China to outside. And I think since 2017 and 2018, the Chinese government is paying attention and kind of like really preventing this kind of flow. Um, so this is not just happening in Latin America. Um, and most of the investment was initially focused more on ex extraction but in the past few years, we see more investment in the infrastructure projects, right? Electricity and other infrastructure. And this also has related to um, kind of China's big shift in emphasizing and in investing um, in infrastructure projects overseas. And this is also related to the Belt and Road Initiative. Right, so um, again, just compare like, um, compared to the rest of the world, China's investment definitely focus heavily on infrastructure projects as opposed to other areas. And a little bit about greenfield investment, um, again, reached the highest point in the past few years, but started to slow down um, recently. And, we st and most of the investments still focus either on extraction um, or in manufacturing. Mm -hmm. And that's similar to uh, the trade pattern between China and the Latin American area. So this picture is about um, China's official finance, right? so official foreign aid from the government. And again, it's slowing down. It reached the highest point in 2010, and that's also related to kind of global financial crisis. Like right after global financial crisis, um, China invested a lot more um, in the areas outside of the Western world because the government realized that um, it's not very profiting 
in investing either in the United States or Western Europe. And that's the beginning point that China is looking for more investment opportunities in Latin America, in uh, Middle East, also in Africa. Right? So that's, um, and then the government is contemplating uh, the idea of Bell Road Initiative. Which, initiate, which was initiated um, in 2013. Um, and again, both of these projects were investing, were focusing on infrastructure. Okay, so that's the general picture. Uh, infrastructure, energy, infrastructure, and energy. Um, and China is helping Latin American governments building um, railway, airports, and some electricity plants. And that's basically what Chinese factory, Chinese companies are very capable of. And China, those Chinese companies have already gained also experiences in building these infrastructure projects domestically. And now, um, I think the domestic infrastructure projects were largely complete. And that's why um, those companies are looking for opportunities internationally. And Latin America is just one of the areas among, um, in addition to Africa, in addition to Middle East, um, that those companies are looking for more opportunities. And BRI, right? So this is a more recent initiatives. Um, and a lot of these were kind of compatible to the investment pattern and trade patterns that we see. And it's just that after Xi Jinping came to power, um, he really wanted to have some of his personal individual legacy. Um, <coughs> and a lot of these projects that were implemented already also kind of like put into this umbrella of the Bell and Road Initiative. Right, so um, for those of you who are less familiar with this Bell and Road Initiative, basically this is a very ambitious plan to build a global network of transportation. Um, so there's, um, I don't have a map for this, but you can go back to, um, I think the World Affairs Channel have a video about me talking about the oral nation. Mm -hmm. But the general idea is that, um, so initially Latin Manor Group was not in the picture of, La, um, of this BRI idea. Right, so it was more about connecting China to Western Europe, to Africa, through Central um, Asia, through Middle East, right, so the picture, and also connecting to Southeast Asian countries through the sea route. Right, so Latin America was not initially in this picture, but since this area also has a huge demand for infrastructure projects, and also it fit into this kind of like the three worlds idea of the Chinese government. So gradually, um, Latin America was also incorporated into this Bell and Road Initiative. And so right now, 12 countries are listed as affiliates of the Bell and Road Initiative. Right? So they either sign an agreement with the Chinese government or they express the interest in doing so. Right? So because, um, this, this initiative was, in, um, was proposed in 2012, but it really uh, took kind of um, full shape in 2016 and 17, and this is still an ongoing um, project, very ambitious, um, and so lots of things are still going on. So right now, 12 um, countries decided to join or express their interest in joining, and there are a couple of other um, countries are considered as prospective members of AIIB, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Right? So this is a new regional institution um, initiated by China and really trying to kind of play a similar role as IMF, but really focus more on the um, bail role initiative. Right? So um, then money to the governments who needs investment um, infrastructure projects, um, and China is playing a big role in this organization. Okay, so that was basically the big picture about the bilateral economic relationships of 
between China and North America. Right? And there's um, some political considerations in the bilateral relationship. And one of the first or more important, most important issue from the Chinese government perspective is the Taiwan issue. So Taiwan issue is kind of um, salient in the bilateral relationship between China and Latin America because um, still Beijing and Taipei are competing for international legitimacy, right? So who represents China, right? So is it People's Republic of China, which like, uh, were recognized mostly by the majority of um, the countries, or Republic of China, which is the official name of Taiwan, right? So the basically the party, the Communist Party, for the civil war with the Nationalist Party, uh, the national back in na late 1940s. So the Communist Party went and the Nationalist Party flew to Taipei and uh, maintained the position there since, to the, um, since 1949. And I mean, we can talk about like another hour about this topic, but I will move on. The general idea is um, Latin America is very important um, in this Taiwan issue. Because for now, um, there are still 15 countries that recognize the Republic of China as the legitimate representation of China. And nine of them are in Latin America. And so for years, those Latin American countries or governments that recognize Taiwan or recognize the uh, Republic of China as the legal representative of China um, for years, they are really competing or like um, playing between Beijing and Taipei and try to uh, ask for more financial support, financial assistance, economic uh, privilege, FTA, etc., etc., in order to kind of like, hey, if you give me more, I will recognize you. If Beijing gives me more, I will recognize you. Right? So there's always kind of this kind of political slash economic game between. Um, between those Latin American countries that still recognize Taiwan and Beijing and Taipei. And so there was a diplomatic choose between Beijing and Taipei um, from 2008 to 2016 because the pro-unification party won the election in Taiwan and so Beijing and Taipei have this kind of like honeymoon period for eight years. So there was diplomatic truth, right? So neither of the neither Beijing nor Taipei would really try to compete for those Latin American countries and other countries in the world. But in the past few years, um, Taiwan the current president in Taiwan was more kind of pro independence or like at least did not like um, at least Beijing was not very happy with her. And so between 2017 and 2018, um, three countries in Latin America switched their relationship, diplomatic recognition, from the Republic of China to PRC. And of course, um, they received some economic um, benefits from China. Um, and so whether it would have this kind of like domino effect to other Latin American countries, we are not sure. Um, from what I heard, so I was in a meeting last July uh, where there's a senior official from Chinese Foreign Affairs Department. And basically, I mean, he, he, um, he works for Foreign Affairs Department, so you can have some ideas about whether he's saying it's true or not. But basically what he told us in the meeting was that there are lots of these um, remaining 15 countries that still recognize Taiwan really wanted to establish um, diplomatic relationship with PRC because they're looking for more kind of economic benefits or trade relationship with China. And so for what he was saying, um, that Chinese official, so he was really um, very, he was very unhappy with the notion that it's Chinese government giving money to those countries that kind of buy off the diplomatic relationship. Um, according to him, it was more kind of like those Latin American countries or like other small islands in the Pacific area would really wanted to establish relationship with China 
Um, and so the Chinese government basically told them, well, what you need to do is you need to recognize us first. Then we can talk about all these economic benefits or trade, um, free trade agreements. So it was not the other way around. For example, that China giving money first, and then they create a relationship with China. So I'm not sure whether to what extent it's true, but I'm just kind of like showing you this story. But the general idea is that Taiwan issue is um, very kind of like streaky um, in, in this bilateral relationship between China and North America. And because the current relationship um, between China and Taiwan was not, it's not working very well, and there might be some tension going on in the near future. So that may potentially affect um, how those Latin American countries, especially those who still recognize ROC, um, their position about whether they will shift the um, diplomatic relationship from Taiwan to PRC. And another kind of general political consideration is this um, support from Latin American countries in international institutions. Right, so largely speaking, China and LAC states share some lots of um, ideas in common, right? So they have some similarities in recognizing the importance of sovereign national sovereignty and also both of the region kind of supportive for um, climate change, um, all the reforms in climate change or some initiatives in climate changes. But when it comes to human rights issue, um, the results are kind of mixed, right? So this is from some other scholar studies. Um, so the variation can over time, right? So probably in the 1990s, we see more convergence of the views of Chinese government and Latin American countries, at least in the UN General Assembly, in their voting patterns, right? So this is usually an indicator um, that IR scholars would like to use when they try to analyze um, the foreign policy similarities between two countries or between two areas. Right? So they look at uh, their voting patterns in UN General Assembly. And so you see a huge variation between China and Latin American countries over time. So there are some convergence between China and Latin America in the 2000s, probably when President Bush was in power, but when Obama was in power, we started to see more divergence between China and Latin America. And so the data does not cover the current period, right? So when President Trump um, was in power, but I would probably imagine currently we would see a greater convergence between China and Latin America in the UN, at least. And it's also varying within the region, right? So for example, if you look at Caribbean countries or like Mexico and those, their voting patterns would be more similar to the voting patterns to the United States. But if you look at um, like Brazil and other like Southern American countries who has closer relationship with China, um, Venezuela, etc., and their voting patterns would be more similar to that in China, right? So huge variation within the region. And Finally, I'll talk briefly about what Chinese investment or Chinese um, economic relationship imply to the region. Right, so is it really a win-win situation? Um, I think Chinese investment definitely brought some positive impacts to the region. Right, so um, in terms of building clean energy and also some electricity projects and also improve infrastructure development in the region. Right, so that's again one of the strength of Chinese investment nowadays. And which also facilitated economic growth, right? So that's kind of the selling point when the Chinese government was trying to sell the Bell Road initiative to the outside world, right? So they really trying to sell the model of Chinese economic success by focusing on infrastructure um, which can facilitate the economic growth. Um, they tried to sell this idea to um, other developing countries. And some of the limitations, right? So there's no strings attached pattern, um, as well covered by some developing countries for sure, but it was also criticized 
by Western society um, regarding the problem of lack of transparency. Um, and there's also lots of environmental concerns, especially among the local communities in Latin America. And also, there's some complaints from the local com communities that the Chinese companies or Chinese investors were not paying sufficient attention to local culture, right? So they're kind of like just forming their own tribe uh, where they operated locally and did not really pay attention to incorporating those local culture, right? So there's lots, um, some complaints from local communities. And how do we view this? Um, so I kind of quoted a in-depth report from South China Morning Post. And so I think there's lots of um, mixed views about Chinese presence in this area. Right? So on one hand, we can kind of view Chinese investors as a newcomer. Right? So this is not the area China um, has been explored very much. Um, so China is really newcomer in the region. And so there's definitely a learning curve here. Um, those companies, they're definitely making mistakes, but I think over time they will learn, right? So China may be really investing in this area only in the past 10 years, right? So compared to Chinese familiarity with Southeast Asia or even with Africa, um, Latin America is really a new area for both Chinese government and Chinese companies as well. And another report um, from the Carter Center, and I think one of you also, also wrote the piece for the Great Division Theories, right? So um, their argument is that actually um, host government, host country government should also take more responsibility. The idea is that so far the bilateral investment or bilateral trade are, are really working in the government level. And this is what Chinese government or Chinese companies are good at. Chinese companies um, or investors are less capable or less experienced in interacting with local communities. And, but that doesn't mean that they are, they are still paying lots of attention to the demands from local governments. And that's why um, some of the arguments are really emphasizing that those local governments should take more responsibility. Um, they, should, they can make more demands that require the Chinese investors pay more attention to environmental concerns um, coming up with a street standards about these inv investments. And usually if these demands were initiated by the local government, by the host governments, Chinese companies um, are willing to comply. And by the same respect, they didn't know the requirements existed. Or sometimes the host governments, they were very desperate or very um, willing to attract Chinese companies, Chinese investments. Sometimes they will lower the standards, and that caused the problems in the local community when, it, when those in, um, investments were implemented in reality. So perhaps the local government or host government um, can actually make a more strict standards about all these Chinese investments. And largely speaking, if Chinese government or Chinese investors wanted to um, pursue economic opportunities, they usually comply. Because again, um, as I mentioned, I, I think mostly those investors would just wanted to gain profits. They didn't really want to cause lots of trouble um, in a local community. And why those, sometimes the host governments are so desperate for Chinese investment, such that they will lower the standards, but right? um, I think it's partially related to the lack of alternative um, options for Latin American countries right now. And this is also the same for some of the African countries, right? So China is probably the only available donor or investor for those countries. And there's not much alternative nowadays, and China is definitely offering a better package in general. And that's why um, some of the host, um, host governments are really willing to attract Chinese investment sometimes they, they, they sacrifice environmental concerns or some um, strict requirements. And that's um, kind of like related to my last point, right? So who can provide alternative models to Chinese economic 
um, I think U.S. is definitely um, a potential alternative, um, and U.S. has been doing this in the past several decades. It's just that recently the U.S. government is uh, declining or like reducing its role in this area a little bit when President Trump is in power. Um, so what does Chinese in, um, rising presence in Latin America imply to the United States? So far, I don't think both countries are really competing in the area, again, because China is still a newcomer, uh, whereas the United States has been very influential in this region for decades, right? So, and what China needs most from Latin America was energy and resources, and that are not really in direct competition against the United States in the region, at least for now. And also, China did not have, does not have any kind of like territory disputes or like territory demands in the area, and this is very different from China's position in East Asia, right? So both like China and United States definitely are in a higher level of tension in East Asia. Right? So Taiwan issues, South China disputes, and if there are potential kind of geopolitical conflicts between China and United States, East Asia would be um, the candidate, but not in Latin America, right? So both countries do not really have any kind of like geopolitical competition or like territorial competition in the area. So that's definitely a global priority in the relationship between China and United States. And finally, um, the competition between Washington and Beijing is more about the economic model or like political model, and and that's why um, and that's also the major theme between the U.S. China competition in general. Right? Um, and if we think about this, like three years ago, there might be some competition in the international organization or international order. But, so China was long considered as kind of like a potential challenger to the international system. But um, personally, I would be a little bit cautious about that at the, like nowadays, because um, there's definitely some counter arguments about who actually wanted to maintain the international order nowadays. Um, if we look at like Chinese active participation in international institutions nowadays, whereas um, President Trump which might be a little bit of uh, exception, but at least for now, Washington is trying to reduce its role in international institutions. Right? So I will be a little bit cautious about who really wanted to change the international system for now, but it's definitely a competition about economic models and political models. And I think that would be uh, a real competition in, this, uh, in Latin America and Caribbean area. So I will stop here. Um, and really looking forward to your comments and questions in the next session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Great, thank you. Um, so, do you all hear the question? Great. Um, yeah, so I want to first a little bit comments about your comments earlier, right? So, like, lots of um, companies, like, they bring their own Chinese workers, like, they don't hire local people. And I think that's one of the biggest complaints from the local communities, um, as um, I read the report analysis recently. And, and that's well, that's actually somehow consistent with my observation and I, my point earlier, is that when China investing in those infrastructure projects, they're really trying to address the domestic excess of these domestic capacity, industrial capacity. So, because many of these projects domestically will complete, and, and but those companies still exist, they need to look for other opportunities and since domestic opportunities kind of like finish already, they have to look for international opportunities. And so I think that's why, so they still hire lots of Chinese workers because that's the real problem they want to solve. Of course, that definitely brings um, local concerns. And if, I think if those Chinese investors or like Chinese government wanted to sustain their investment <coughs> in, in, in Latin America or in Africa, other African countries. And I think that's the problem they really need to solve, right? Because it's not, they really need to think about how to work with local communities and maybe hire part of Chinese workers, part of local workers to address the, um, and so there's also kind of also beyond kind of purely economic consideration, it's more kind of like cultural consideration, right? So I'm not sure whether you, um, watched a Netflix documentary, The China Factory. Um, that just won the documentary, like a Academy Award documentary. Um, so that's a very interesting documentary about how a Chinese um, company opened a factory in Ohio, I think. And that caused like lots of kind of like cultural um, cleavage about like, okay, Chinese workers, they work overtime or like always, and, and that's fine for them. But they, the American workers, they, um, they tend not to work overtime and they also pay more attention to kind of like safety um, requirements and all that. And that caused like lots of kind of cultural cleavage. And I think sometimes the Chinese company, like initially they just didn't want to cause any trouble. They think it's easier for them to hire Chinese workers because they, or they already know each other. But I think in the long run, if you really want to invest locally in the long term, the cultural issue, that's something that you really want to address. And back to the default problem, um, I think that's one of the biggest fear um, out in, in, in the international community about all kinds of Chinese investment. And I think the, the, the project in Sri Lanka kind of caused lots of attention. Like, okay, if those um, developing countries cannot pay back the debt, like, is the Chinese government going, going to um, own these projects? Um, I. I think this is something that the Chinese government has already noticed. Um, and whether that would be the case, I think it would be operated by the kind of like case by case scenario. And even though, so my sense is that if that happens in the future, and if that potentially <coughs> causes lots of domestic concerns, um, either the Chinese government will revise the terms, or the local governments will not sign the deals with the Chinese government in the first place. Because the, because um, that, that's already happening, like some of the foreign governments, they decided not to, I mean, they initially expressed interest in joining BRI, and then kind of like walk away later because of those concerns. But so, this is something that I think eventually is the decision of local government. I don't think the, the Chinese government is forcing um, local government to sign a deal with them, and so if those foreign governments like kind of agree with that, and I think that's kind of like again because of maybe the lack of alternative models for now, and that's what um, I think many scholars and, and personally I, I I would like to see kind of more conditions um, in terms of like foreign investment, right? So so that those local governments, those developing countries can have more choices as opposed to like China as being like. Available investors, but 
that really raised lots of domestic concerns or like even domestic unrest. Personally, I think China's not going to take care of that or like would, actually, would definitely uh, consider local concerns. Because I think the least thing that Chinese government wanted to be considered is kind of like another cold crisis. Even though this might be the case um, uh, from some, some people's perspective, but I don't think that's what China's government if that's the case, they will definitely do something to kind of revise that image. And I think that's something that they might be already doing. So I think it's kind of like that dynamic process. If the domestic arrest is very significant, it's very serious, and I think China's government will definitely change some of this position. Yes. I wonder about the possibility of looking at this more optimistic. Especially from um, the perspective of Chinese government, because like um, whenever I went back home, I watched some like Chinese TV news, especially from international channel. And one of the kind of like most frequent news that you will see is kind of like Chinese operation in their role initiated overseas and how many achievements that um, those companies um, have completed. And sometimes you will see, of course, there's kind of like propaganda elements of those official news, but. You definitely see some like reports about how um, those Chinese companies and mostly state owned um, they went to local communities like initially they, they, they have trouble like dealing with local workers or like local communities. Um, and, but eventually they learn and they kind of come up with solutions and then kind of like achieve cooperation. So I think these kind of news do exist. And, and, I, and I definitely agree with um, your earlier point. It's kind of like previously it was more kind of like conditionality model, and I mean it worked in some places and didn't work in some places. And I think China just comes as kind of like a new alternative, and no one knows whether it's working. But it's kind of like this is something new, and that's try it. And and I think everything is still kind of in experimenting now. Yeah. Yes. I don't have a question. the background, which uh, during my previous life, I worked 22 years for Latin American affairs. There are 16, 16 of them living in Latin America. Uh, and uh, also as director of Asian affairs, as a matter of fact, and director for Latin American affairs in my home country, which is not the US. Uh, I think what, what needs to be told her, and I'll start with a little anecdote. When President Xi, Xi yeah. visited Costa Rica in, I believe it was 2013, I was living in Costa Rica. Costa Rica is one of the few Latin American countries which has a rather untarnished democratic history, at least since 1948. Uh, not many Latin American countries can say that. Um, there I could say, I could see firsthand the, shall we call it, tidal war between what you touched up on, namely between uh, the People's Republic of China, which is of course a, by all necessary measurements, 
dictation. And the Republic of China, Taiwan, which later in history has become a rather full-fledged and transparent democracy. Uh, so there's two different systems. Uh, the uh, Taiwanese managed to stay on for quite some time in Costa Rica. And ironically, I used to drive across a bridge when I went to the beach. I had a beach house on the Pacific coast. I lived four and a half years in Costa Rica at that time. And it was called the Bridge of Friendship between the Taiwanese and the Costa Rican peoples. A lovely bridge over the Gulf of the Nicoya. However, the Chinese from the People's Republic of China <coughs> built a new football stadium, for real football, the one we play in Europe, with our feet, not the one here, which I don't consider to be football, but that's a nice guy. Uh, they built a new football stadium, um, which cost, of course, a lot more money than the bridge, and was also too big for Costa Rica, all built by Chinese workers. I visited their living quarters, which by, was for any Western European, a pop and created a lot of conflicts with the local community. But basically, and Costa Rica tried, which most of at least the Central American countries have tried to do, to sit on two chairs at the same time. But that doesn't work when you're playing what is it, the musical chairs, you know? There's one chair that's going to be pulled away from you. So one precondition, of course, that with the People's Republic of China always have before investing money is what you touched on. Namely that the country, in this case Costa Rica, break off relations with the Republic of China, which they consequently did, which of course always means, or most of the time means, that the poor Taiwanese, Taiwanese ambassador has to go home with his crew and probably also will have to look uh, for a new job. So what the Latin American countries to some extent are being here, they are being bought out by an authoritarian dictatorship to choose that which have more money than the uh, Republic of China. And this has been an ongoing process in Latin America. There are, the, China, the Republic of China is not doing this without having geopolitical thoughts. We have to be aware, we see it in Africa as well, and we see it also in Asia, but not mostly in Asia. When you look at Latin America today, you find, of course, that uh, the People's Republic of China is actively supporting Maduro in Venezuela, which most of other countries, my own included, have declared maybe not to be a legal president, or at least having run his country down the abyss, uh, taking over uh, <coughs> But that is, of course, done for geopolitical reasons, to put a, a nail in the eye of the United States and Western Europe, maybe, and the European Union. <coughs> Taiwan still they maintains a few embassies on the Latin American continent. They have them in Belize, Guatemala, Haiti, Honduras, Nicaragua, Paraguay, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, and the Grenadines. Now, I've lived through several wars in Nicaragua. It is, it is allegedly a leftist, socialist, not democratic, socialist state. Nicaragua still maintains diplomatic relations with the Republic of China, which is interesting. Uh, which is very interesting because you profess yourself to the ideology which is, I would say, also professed by, by the people's Republic of China. But that's because the Taiwanese have been able to outpay so far the people's Republic of China. So let's not be fooled. We have to choose between systems here. The people's Republic of China do nothing without a political price to be paid by the country which receives the investment from Beijing. And I could go on forever, but I won't. Well, no. And Costa Rica is an older democracy than the United States, I believe. I've been to the capital there. I was hugely impressed by the middle class. No, and, it's uh, not an the older democracy. <laughs> Costa Rica came to democracy in 1948 after a short and bloody domestic. Right. No, I think you, well, what you're saying is absolutely right, and and that's why I'm saying um, like the the Taiwan issue is kind of like 
very important topic in a bilateral relationship between China and Latin American countries. Um, so that part definitely had a lot of political consideration. And in the past, like both Beijing and Taiwan um, were competing for um, recognition. And I think that step is is kind of accelerating um, whenever Beijing and Taiwan, Taipei relationship are not very good, and that's now, um, and that's why like, uh, even despite the diplomatic choose between 2008 and 2016. And so that was not, so during the diplomatic choose, uh, what I heard is that even though there are a couple of like small countries, um, not necessarily North America, but like countries that recognize ROC, they wanted to, they wanted more economic opportunities <coughs> from PRC and they wanted to establish <coughs> diplomatic relationship with PRC and the, the, the Beijing government. Kind of like, wait, wait, um, that's hold for a while because we have, still have good relationship with Taiwan uh, between that period and so that's not do this to kind of make the Taiwanese government look bad. Uh, but that was not no longer a consideration nowadays because Beijing um, does not have a good relationship with Taiwan nowadays. And, and I definitely think about, I agree that there's definitely competition between political systems, political regimes, and that's um, one of the major themes of US-China competition right now. But from the perspective of those Latin American governments who decided whether to recognize Taipei or Beijing, um, I don't think they are really kind of choosing between democracy and autocracy when they decided like which government to recognize. Um, I think it's still more about kind of like who can give me more more benefits. And there's some occasional cases, like rare cases, when they switch back from PRC to ROC. I mean that's relatively less often, but we still see the case when like some countries decided to switch the diplomatic relationship from PRC to ROC if the latter provides more economic benefits. So I think just with, just in terms of <coughs> diplomatic re recognition, um, there's more economic consideration. And also United States was, is playing a big role behind this process, right? So US, Washington was not happy at all when um, Dominican Republic and El Salvador and Panama switched the re diplomatic recognition from ROC to PRC. And I think Washington was trying to reverse the, their position a little bit, but um, it was not successful. Mostly, I think, because, again, maybe the current administration is a little bit unusual. Like, they, uh, President Trump is kind of really playing this America first principle, and they don't want it to uh, provide more uh, commitments, more support into um, other foreign countries, and that kind of like make their um, kind of leaning towards PRC a little bit nowadays. But yeah, I will stop it. Yes. Uh, the amount of money that um, PRC has put into Latin America is, from what I've read, in one of this, as much as a trillion dollars in the infrastructure. Amounts of money in Africa and so on. This, from a country that declares itself as still a third world country, uh, you, know, you go to the World Bank or the IMF, that's what they're claiming. The question, particularly since the Chinese government thinks in very long periods of time, 25, 50 years, what is the long term strategy here for that level of investment? What do they want out of that? 25, 30, 50 years from now? Great question. Um, so I think in the long term, it's definitely trying to strengthen the connection with the, with the outside of the world. It's kind of similar to, I mean, there's disagreement, but like I think to simplify things a little bit, you can definitely see it as kind of like a Chinese version of Marshall Plan, as what the United States did after World War II, right? So in the, long, in, the, in the short term, I think it's more about solving domestic economic problems, right? So really reduce the excessive problems of all these Chinese factories. They need to look for some economic opportunities. The Chinese workers need to hire. But in the long run, I think um, 
there's definitely some geopolitical consideration that Chinese, um, China wants to increase its presence in those regions. But, so this is something that I'm not very sure, like all of these like BRI, like how long it can sustain. Because like right now, I really see it as President Xi Jinping's personal legacy. Uh, but even if he may stay in power for like more than 10 years, like I don't know how long he will stay in power. But like one day if he leaves office, whether this initiative would continue, no one knows. I mean, maybe there's, so there's two possibilities, I think. Either this com initiative completely goes, disappear, and, but, and, and all these kind of infrastructure, infrastructure projects kind of like decline. That's one possibility. Um, and the other possibility would be, well, we don't have this umbrella of federal initiative, but the infrastructure projects still continue just under another new name or new labor when a new leader comes to office. I think these are two possibilities. That which one is true or which one we are going to predict, like I think really depends on Chinese own economic power. Right. So if China can sustain its economic growth, like even though like five percent, six percent, which is kind of low compared to um, previous decades. But if China can can still continue this rate of economic growth. I think those infrastructure projects may continue. But if China is facing some really serious economic problems, and I think that would definitely affect this kind of current expansion of economic power that we see nowadays. I just wanted to um, pose a question that um, perhaps um, scholars may have looked at the, um, or what scholars might have looked at this is related to completely isolating Taiwan. Once no one, no state recognizes Taiwan, there, do you really think there's any reason that the Chinese, uh, the People's Republic of China would say, hey, this isn't a state, nobody recognizes it, and can either, I don't think they'd attack, but uh, take it over with nobody there to say can't do that. Um, so the greenfield investment is just as opposed to mergers and acquisitions. So greenfield refers to kind of like building completely new business. Yeah, so mergers and investment, uh, mergers and acquisition, just kind of you buy some old companies that are owned by some previous owners and just like um, 
switch the ownership, but the Greenfield in investment, just like, for example, the Chinese company opened a new office in Latin America, or like established a new company in, in, in Latin America. So that's what um, Greenfield investment is about. But thank you for asking that. And military bases, uh, this is definitely something very new. Um, I know China is building military bases in Africa. I'm not really sure about Latin America yet, but there's definitely some negotiation going on. And so I think this is still at the early stage, and this is also an indicator about China's rise. Right? So like I don't think anyone is kind of denying it. And so this is what so there's definitely some parts of China that is doing something that are very similar to what the United States was doing when it was rising. Right? So it's kind of like there's some checklist for a rise of great power looks like, and maybe building military bases or like increasing military presence beyond East Asia is one of that checklist for China to become like a, to reach this great power status. And I think this is very um, so this is very unusual, um, and this only occurred when Xi Jinping came to power, right? So he really kind of like um, did not at least did not completely continue what Deng Xiaoping's speech kind of keeping low profile legacy, right? So under his term, we see a huge kind of transformation of Chinese foreign relations. And also he um, did lots of job in kind of like modernizing Chinese military. Um, and that's also very new, uh, very different from what his previous leaders um, were doing. But when it comes to like actual military bases, Again, I think this is also, this is similar to just infrastructure project in the sense that China, the Chinese government needs the approval of host governments. And it's always kind of just a negotiation. I, I like to see it as a negotiation process between China and whatever host governments. And so if the host governments decided to like allow that to happen, and it's definitely trying to maybe provide some economic benefits or other benefits, and in return they um, But I don't think that's kind of a done deal, right? So even if the local government holds it now, things will still change, right? So this is just how typical international politics works, right? So you make a deal today, but tomorrow it may change, right? So it's kind of still continuing going on, but yeah. Thank you. Respectfully. I disagree that uh, the present administration is withdrawing from the world, world stage. I think rather that they switched their uh, way of dealing uh, in trade benefits that are reciprocal versus pouring huge amounts of foreign aid that often stays at the top of these dictatorships. And it seems to me that the trade embargo has the new, been the new tool to um, to bring people to the negotiating table as opposed to just writing, sending loads and loads of American money. And um, again, I don't think that we're withdrawing, our policy is withdrawing from the world stage because I see this administration being very supportive of the new leadership in Brazil, which is very much for the people. And also, um, I saw huge support for Hong Kong, and, and I think we've been very friendly with Japan so we're not removing ourselves from the from that area to protect Taiwan. I think we're supportive, but we're doing it in a more quiet, diplomatic way, rather than, and, and I know China's important to us to control North Korea, because we can't go in there and drop bombs on them. But, and also, as far as the, the countries that are aligned with the PRC, they are seeing, those countries seem to be the ones with the highest volume of people who are leaving. You know, my, like, well, 50 years ago, my political science professor impressed on me that refugees vote with their feet. And those countries, Guatemala, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Dominican, they're the ones who are all trying to get into this country and away from those. Anyway, I, I just wondered if you would you know, share. I, I, I just didn't feel we were withdrawing from the world state. We're just not financing the world any longer. No, I think that's a made good trade agreements that are reciprocal with other countries where we've done Mm -hmm. and Mexico and Canada, and I believe we would like 
So I think let me rephrase a little bit. I think that what you describe is a more accurate. So I, I, I'm not trying to emphasize that U.S. is withdrawing, but in a sense that so my understanding about what U.S. did um, in the past 40, 50 years, or like since the end of World War II, is that U.S. has been investing a lot in building international order and in investing in international institutions. And that I completely agree with you, that's sometimes disproportional, right? So U.S. invests a lot more and maybe receive a little bit less, right? So when you look at U.S. relationship with Japan or that U.S. relationship with Western Europe, it's definitely that U.S. kind of like contributing a lot more compared to its allies. And I completely agree with that. But I think that's, so that's somewhat what the current administration disagree with. But what previous administrations um, wanted to do is to kind of like, they kind of see as U.S. as a great power. So you have to, as a great power, you have to invest in something and look at it in the long run and not really looking at kind of like short term return. So I think that's the impression or that's the world view of previous U.S. leaders. And I think current administration is changing and I think that's totally fine. And I think that definitely reflects the current consideration of U.S. national interest. So, and I could completely agree with you that it's not like U.S. completely withdrawing from international stage. It's just like changing status and it wanted to ask for more responsibility from its allies, right? So it wanted to, they wanted Japan to contribute more. They wanted Western Europe to contribute more. And I think that definitely reflects the national interest of the United States right now. And yeah, go ahead. Because appeasement with Iran and it has and North Korea hasn't worked. Mm -hmm. And I, I respect the fact that it seems to me this administration is that all the Latin American countries have been in the Oval Office, and you know our the the, the, out, the, the president, the new the duly elected people elected a leader of Venezuela was at the State of the Union. So I, I hate to say that we're withdrawing from the world. I think it's just a different approach. Yeah, I completely agree with that, and I think the support for liberal democracy um, order, I think is th this position has not changed. And, and I agree with that. Yes. I would just like to speak to what I obviously how do you view the possibility of the truly world standing actor in medical problems in China to play the part now? Mm -hmm. I think that's sort of the bear in the room. Nobody knows what's going to happen. Yeah. It's definitely damaging their long term economic as well as world view attitude. That worries me kind of hard to predict what's going to happen when life happens sometimes that you don't anticipate. Yeah. And that, that to me is could skew all of these long range plans in China. Do you think that's a real possible problem? Largely I would agree with you, even though like those of these are still ongoing and I'm so glad you bring this out because like this coronavirus Stuff, like it's occupying my social media in the past months. Mm -hmm. um, so my sense is that it's going to create lots of difficulties for Chinese economy. At least this year, um, no one really knows what the long-term effect look like because it will really depend on how fast or like how slow this problem will be solved. But right? so I think right now. Um, from my understanding, kind of like entire country is kind of like just stop, right? So um, factories are did not open, and like um, schools did not open, or like people just like maybe people stay at home most of the time, and they didn't go to grocery shopping unless it's like super necessary. My, my parents stay at home most of the time, um, so I think that will cause a huge problems for Chinese economy, and. And, and also, it will cause some potential problem for the Chinese governors, right? So there's, I mean, if you read the news, there's some dissatisfaction and frustration about at least how local governments have been handling um, the virus, especially like when it break out earlier, right? So right now, I think the central government is taking over um, and some of the top officials in the local governments were fired and I think that's kind of like how Chinese government, at least central government, is dealing with the problem like this always, right? So you find some like scapegoats and, and fire local officials and, and that at least 
reduce the domestic anger a little bit and really try to focus on solving this problem. I think the Chinese government, the, the, the central government really wanted to solve the virus or solve the virus problem like within two months. I think that's the goal. They really want to make it under control within this month. Um, but I don't know whether it can be done or not. Because usually what happened in March, like March is kind of like big months for like Chinese politics because the National Congress is holding annual conference. And so that's usually kind of all the delegates from all over China Beijing and have this like a week long conference which has a very huge political implications to both Chinese government and the party and so there's still rumor about like like no one really knows whether this Congress this national Congress conference is going to um, take place in March or not the rumor is kind of like Xi Jinping really wanted to make everything controlled within February and still have a conference um, conducted in March but no kind of like official announcements um, have been made yet. And right now, most of the schools were um, suspended until mid-March. And some factories are reopening now, but I think the, the rate is probably like within 30% or 40%, because like there's still lots of concern that if like, because right now kind of like the, the, the entire country is kind of like just quiet and, and not in stock. And that's somewhat effective in preventing the spread of virus. But if the current country kind of like be, becoming active again, and everyone goes back to work, everyone moves from small smaller cities back to Beijing, Shanghai, with all these kind of high speed way railways, and that would potentially kind of like accelerate the spread of virus. So the short answer is I'm not sure, and and there's even no concerns like so. I, I saw an estimate is that if everything could be put under control within the first season of the year, um, I think the national the GDP growth this year may still be able to maintain like 5.2 percent, and and that's but that's all kind of hinges off the assumption that the virus can be put control within the first season. If that's not the case, um, I think things are going to be. From the macro, perhaps to the micro, back to your investments. How many of these investments qualify as gifts? And how, what percent do you have any data on, on what kind of repayment programs are put in place for these various projects and these various companies? I don't have something on top of my head. Right? So, but I think what so we need to kind of separate that kind of like all these mergers and acquisition, which is more kind of like business oriented, profit oriented investment. Um, whereas the official foreign aid is more about like, we just give you money, no strings attached. Um, you can do whatever you want with this money. And some, I, I don't have anything on top of my head, but I think it's kind of like a mix, right? So it's maybe, 30% of all the money is more just like, okay, it's, we bought, we give, we lend you money as kind of just a loan, and you need to invest in infrastructure projects, and you may need to give some benefits to Chinese companies, um, but there's also some other part of money, which is just kind of free money, in exchange for, for example, political support in international institutions. I think it's kind of like a combination, but I'm sorry, I don't have a like well, that's, that's very interesting because the bottom line here is this is not the market. Well, part you of it. Part of it. Part, I think it's part of it. Yeah. The percent is interesting. The football stadium that was coming around in Costa Rica uh, was that simply a gift, or did the government of Costa Rica have to pay back over a period maybe of 30, 40 years, or or what? It makes a heck of a difference yeah. as, to so what, as to what the yeah. agreement is. Yeah, so that's why um, I think it's kind of complicated. Um, <coughs> there's no, and that's why I think the, 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 the international society wanted to want more transparency. 
for Chinese um, foreign aid or whatever, whether it's official assistance or whether it's more about kind of like private investment. Um, I have to admit to you though, like the data from China is first difficult to get, and second is always less reliable, and I, I would definitely um, kind of um, admit to that. So there is a effort in collecting Chinese foreign aid by actually Williams and Mary College here in Virginia. They um, they have like this kind of like foreign aid data, aid data, that kind of thing. I'm trying to really specify the amount of money from Chinese uh, from China to all over the world by looking at the kind of like Chinese official like news media, newspapers and local newspapers and really try to um, specify like which project they invest. So yeah, so I think some scholars may do some research about that. But yeah, I don't have any I think it really is a combination of everything. Yeah. Any more quick questions? Could you address the Belt and Road Initiative's um, new focus on communications and um, networks and the cloud computing? We're building a belt. Yeah. So the 5G technologies and all, all that. Yes. Yes. Very good. Um, there's lots of concerns about, and, and and I don't think anyone pay attention to this until Washington like bring up Huawei, the case of Huawei, and so I think this is really kind of like a hidden issue nowadays. Um, on the one hand, I think United States really wanted to kind of push all the, like foreign governments not to use Huawei. Um, in, in building 5G technology, but there's huge variation among foreign governments about whether they want to accept or whether at least consider um, Chinese technology in building 5G networks. Um, so, well, first of all, it's the Chinese technology or like Huawei's technology is cheaper, it's more cost effective, that's for sure. But on the other hand, there's definitely some kind of like national security concerns that highlighted um, by Washington. Um, my sense is, well on, the one, well, on the one hand, I don't think the United States has kind of like a smoking gun evidence yet. And that's why that caused huge variation about like whether we should listen to the United States and completely block Huawei or Chinese technology. Because at least for now, there's no kind of like smoking gun, like very straightforward evidence saying that um, Huawei or the Chinese company are using this type of technology to like steal private um, privacy and etc. And like, they, they, I think there's evidence that like, Chinese military, there's some like, um, evidence about military using cyber attack and all that. But like, just focus on Huawei as an individual company there's not yet like smoking gun evidence. But the concern about Huawei or Chinese companies is always kind of related back to this very um, interesting relationship between Chinese government and all kinds of Chinese companies. Because the concern is always that, okay, China is such a country that the party kind of has all kinds of control, all kinds of power. And even though there's no evidence that the government is asking Huawei to provide data for now, but the concern is always like, what happened in the future? Right, so it's kind of like, are we really need to concern about the future and take some preemptive measures? Or like, are we just focused on like evidence-based um, idea that, okay, if there's no evidence for now and we should be fine using it and we should take approaches along the way when new threats are coming out. Right? So I think it's, it's really about like are you like which position you are looking at this relationship. Like are you taking more kind of like preemptive position? Are you like okay, that's good kind of made evidence for now and and escalate if necessary. So that's kind of like my general idea about what's going on in just all the 5G stuff. Alright, so <laughs> our time limit, I feel like we could another 30, 45 minutes with the questions. Um, but thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for being